I want to talk to you this morning about kingdom superstars. Kingdom superstars. And that can be a challenging title, but go with me this morning to Daniel chapter number 12. We're going to be reading verses 1 to 3. I'm conscious of the time this morning, and I'm excited to eat. (laughs) And it's free. Who can argue with that? And I want to make sure that Kim and Leon don't go anywhere because I think I want to do something with you this morning. But Daniel chapter 12, beginning at verse 1, says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. Even to that time, and at, the, at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. But those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Do you like that scripture? (laughs) Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Yes, the kingdom of God has superstars. Those who are wise, there are two prerequisites here found in Scripture that allow you to become a superstar in the kingdom of God. And it has nothing to do with Hollywood. It has nothing to do with human notoriety. It has everything to do with something beyond this realm, something greater. Those who are wise... What is the value of wisdom today? If I were to ask across this room how many of you need wisdom facing your situation, you would put your hand up, wouldn't you? I find the charismatic church prays for almost everything more than they pray for wisdom. (laughs) And yet the world understands that to be the head and not the tail, you're going to have to have wisdom. The book of Proverbs exhorts us to Ask for wisdom. King Solomon. King Solomon surely shone in his generation. But King Solomon, when he could ask God of anything, and I'm sure some of us would have asked for a house. Some of us would have asked for a financial breakthrough. Some of us would have asked for for a new location or ministry. But Solomon understood that if he could ask for wisdom, all of the rest would follow him. Wisdom is the principal thing. Whether you're engaged in ministry, family, marriage, politics, whatever it may be, those who ask for wisdom, those who are wise, are the ones who will shine. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 5 to 8 says, Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, that's Lady Wisdom. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Let everyone say, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all your getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. We should read the Bible more. (laughs) There's something in here (laughs) that transcends experience, that transcends stream, 
that transcends denomination, that transcends color, that transcends demographic, that transcends where you came from, that transcends where you're going, that transcends your challenges, that transcends your experience, that transcends your family name. There's something called wisdom that will do all these things for you. And it says that at the end of days, the end result is those who found wisdom shall shine like the brightness of the expanse. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 10 to 12 says, When wisdom enters your heart, not your mind, when wisdom enters your heart, and knowledge, gaining knowledge, what kind of knowledge? Knowledge that you have to pay a price for. When And knowledge is pleasant to your soul, discretion will preserve you. Don't we need this in government, Jamil? A whole nation can be transformed. Discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you to deliver you from the way of evil. How do we as believers, what is, the re, what is the reward for the plight of us walking this world? Colin, you said to me yesterday, you said you were driving and you realized, <laughs> like the book of Lamentations, you said, we, Pastor, we come into this world with pain. <laughs> we leave this world with pain. And all the way along, <laughs> we're experiencing pain. What is, the what is the reward for going through life with wisdom? It's that God makes you to shine. Who is a believer that will inherit such a testimony? Those who find wisdom. How do we attain this wisdom that makes us shine like the brightness of the firmament? I want to tell you a couple things now really fast. I know you're hungry, but if you can capture this, there's something in it. There are two doors you've got to go through before the door of wisdom. The first door is knowledge. Knowledge. But knowledge on its own is not enough, is it? In fact, the Bible says those who acquire a lot of knowledge but never get to the second doorway just get a big head. And then your big head won't let you walk through the next doorway. <laughs> First is knowledge. Knowledge, for it to be useful in this world, must give birth to understanding. You've got to understand what you know. You've got to understand it. I remember as a child, my dad taking me to the car wash. It was the first time I had ever seen a car wash before. I had never seen one. I didn't understand how it worked. And when we pulled into the parking lot, I knew I was at a car wash, but I didn't understand how it worked. So I thought that the puddles that had gathered in the ditches of the car wash driveway was what you drove the car through. Maybe I'm not the smartest tool in the shed. I might have even been in a car seat, but I looked and I saw the pools of water and dad was driving through it and I thought, oh, this is a car wash. Do you know that so many of us in the different stages and levels of our lives come into situations as ignorant as a child thinking a puddle is a car wash? We go into marriage ignorant because we don't learn about it. We approach our finances ignorant because we were never taught about it. We enter into the doorway of situations with out having gone through the doorway of knowledge and understanding. You can know the materials just like I know what's in that that crib, that box, when we got a crib for our child. I knew the materials. There were screws and bolts and wood and I'm making myself look dumb again but the, the, I knew all the pieces but I didn't understand how to put them together therefore I lacked wisdom in how to create and God will do this to us won't he he'll give us the tree he won't give us the chair he'll give us the wood but he relies on us to get understanding and get wisdom on how to put the wood together to make a chair so you have the wisdom to sit down on it no no I'm going too far this morning lunch is cooking 
knowledge must give birth to understanding. And understanding, once you get understanding, you can, you can know all the ingredients that go into a bar of soap. But if you don't understand what they create when they're put together, you won't have the wisdom to wash under your arms. Everyone put your hands in the air and say, Amen. <laughs> I, I want to say something loaded now, okay? If ever there was a time we needed to see from God's wisdom perspective, it's now. <laughs> you see, wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge correctly. Wisdom is the ability to do something. It's an action word. The ability to execute what you came into knowing and what you now understand. Wisdom is the ability to act upon it. But you could also say that wisdom is the ability to see something the way God sees it. I'm so amazed at Canadian culture these days. We say and believe some of the dumbest things. <laughs> if there's one thing Canadians, and, and don't take offense because I'm Canadian, it's not because I'm wearing this shirt, but, but if there's one thing we've gotten so good at, it's complaining and then posting it. <laughs> and, and everybody's an expert. I better stop. Yeah, they will start this. It will turn into Q&A. You ask me about COVID. and <laughs> We have just majored on some things in a way, totally forsaking a greater wisdom. There is very little you can do against a wise person. Because even those who were wise enough as families to take the lamb's blood because they understood what it meant and they covered their doorposts. You may not have made it all the way to your child's school and done what you wanted to do there and fix what you wanted to fix in this sphere, but at least you were wise enough to cover the lentils of your family, the doorpost with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you learned how to cover your own home? Do you have the wisdom to meet your children where they're at? To, to, to design a ministry that touches society in such a way that they know the kingdom of God has come upon them. Do you have that wisdom? If there was ever a time as we're facing world events, now we're fighting over should we pray for Palestinians, should we pray for Israel? And you see debates about this. And I say, where is the wisdom as we seek to see from God's perspective? We will begin to understand things and then wisdom will guard every area of our life. Can I get an amen? How many want wisdom? The prophetess came and stood by my shoulder when I was young and she said, God is going to bring you before kings and significant people. And she said, you're going to have to get wisdom. Out of the 100 things I thought I needed, <laughs> she said, you're going to have to get wisdom. And so I took the book of Proverbs and I read every chapter seven times. And I asked for the spirit of wisdom to touch my life. And then I went through the whole book of Proverbs and I wrote down all the characteristics of the wise person, all the characteristics of the fool. And if there's one thing I can tell you about wisdom, it's that, remember when it says she cries aloud in the street? It means that she's available to everybody. She's standing on the corner right there. You've just, she's made it a street thing. Anybody can access the wisdom of God, but you've got to pay the price for knowledge, understanding, to come into that place where wisdom lands on you and is in you. It's one thing to imitate what your pastor said. 
But one day you're going to be in a situation without your pastor there to tell you what to do about it, and you'll try to phone him, you'll try to text me, I mean phone, text him, <laughs> you'll try to reach out, you'll be needing an answer, and you won't have paid the price for wisdom, because someday you'll be in situations you won't have anybody but God Almighty to help you through it. Get wisdom! That's the first prerequisite. For the promise. How can we ensure our place as superstars in the kingdom? The second qualification is that we turn people to righteousness. Is that we turn people to righteousness. The high calling of the local church is not to do church. You know what your calling is? Jesus looked at the people dispirited like sheep without a shepherd. He said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. A local church is a factory of people who are called to labor, who are called to shepherd. We have so tried to box God into a stage, a podium, and the pastor does all the shepherding. I have news for you. I cannot be everywhere at once. I cannot be at your job, Walmart with you, McDonald's with, with you. Well, I might end up at McDonald's with you if you invite me. But, but I cannot be everywhere with you. I operate in five-fold office of pastor, so it's my job to equip you, to train you, to serve you, to crawl on my hands and knees if I have to, to get you prepared to shepherd your sphere of influence out beyond these walls. <laughs> to turn people to righteousness. This begins with the following three things, and then I finish. Number one, how do you turn people to righteousness? Number one, this begins with our own choices to live right. Our choices to do right when others are doing wrong. It starts in our marriage. It starts in what we do as, as a single when no one's looking. It starts with what we do in our families. Our diligence in exhibiting righteousness should be intentional to those closest to us. This is so true. Intentional to our neighbors. Number two, we are to exhibit righteousness, be examples of righteousness, helping to turn people to our families. So number one was ourselves. We have to live righteously. Number two is our families. And, and you ask yourself, what is the product of my own faith or my own righteousness? Listen, I am walking in the byproduct of a righteous generational lineage. I remember talking to my mentor and saying, wow, but you know, so many of my forefathers, they didn't know this or they didn't know that. And, and wow, learning all of these things. And he said to me, but your forefathers' faith has produced this walk for you. They paid a price in faith. Do you know that you are paying a price right now in faith for the next generation to do better than you did? For a generational blessing of righteousness? That's why we honor those who have gone before us, those who are the faithful. We can never turn back and minimize their walk, what they did or didn't do. You are walking through the doorway of righteousness that they paid a price to open. Can I get an amen? amen. And number three is our neighbors, those around us in our sphere of calling our neighbors. This past week, I, I mentor groups online. And two pastors from two groups asked me the question, 
how do you leave legacy? How do you make, the one asked, how do you leave a legacy? I'm only 42, but how do you leave a legacy? And the second pastor asked, how do I make maximum impact? <laughs> Pastors are usually a certain type of personality. So they, they have to do something big. And I knew what the question was. <laughs> they want to know how to break the barrier of 250 or how to do this. How to, they have in their minds what maximum impact means. And I said to this person, and I'll share it with you because it has to do with turning people to righteousness. But I said that we tend to think maximum impact and legacy means buildings, books, resume. And on earth, we applaud those things, and that's part of it. It's good. It's all good. But in heaven, heaven records legacy differently than here on earth. Heaven records maximum impact differently. Jesus went around saying, this is not that. <laughs> maximum impact in the, you know, you say that, but in the kingdom of God, it is not so. And I thought about this as I was asked this question. And I'm conscious that we kind of think that ministry is defined by reaching God's heart with our hearts. Lord, I give you my heart. But I believe that ministry is defined differently than that. Because I can't get away, all through Scripture, God is after mercy to others. From the Old to the New Testament, it's all He's after. And He hid this truth in offense. He should have been born a royal king, He's born in a manger. <laughs> he didn't take over the Roman Empire, He died on a cross. He'll package the kingdom in a certain way. Ministry is not so much about reaching God's heart with your heart as it is reaching people's hearts with God's heart. And this is why we have so much fighting among churches. It's because we're clamoring for territory so we can build our own kingdoms. But Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. We treat our churches like businesses, fighting over clients, fighting for another 10 people. Somebody went to that church. Somebody goes to that church. Somebody said of History Makers Church, don't you dare evangelize people to come to your church. Evangelism. As if you're converting people from one church to another. <laughs> evangelize. Is, this is what Paul talked about as, uh, is Christ's body divided? One says he's of Apollos, one says he's of Pastor so-and-so, one says he goes to this church. Is Christ's body divided? And he said, it's a sign of spiritual babies when you're fussing and fighting and jealous. No, no, I didn't say it. Don't quote me. Paul said it. Do you like Paul? He wrote a third of the New Testament. He said, a sign, I would give you meat, but you can't handle it. And the reason I know you can't handle it is because you're jealous of each other. You're still spiritual babies. Jesus qualified legacy. When he said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. And the disciples said, what? When did we do that for you? <laughs> 
if you did it unto these out there, you did it unto me. We don't have time to fuss and fight. There are people. I didn't even know in, in Oshawa, there are children who are going without meals. And we're starting up our social department because we are a church without walls. And I don't consider my legacy or m making maximum impact to have much to do with the building we meet in. It has to do with the sons and daughters we disciple, train, equip, and send to reach people out there. So I said to this pastor, and I finish with this. I said, I sat with dad by his deathbed when everything was gone. What he would have thought was legacy. I didn't know this at the time, I promise you. But as I read each message that came in, one girl said, when I got pregnant out of wedlock, Pastor Doug invited me into the church. This person, that Pastor Doug took the time with me. He smiled at me. It was one by one, these stories. And I, I had an aha moment. Whether he did or not, he knows now. <laughs> ah, legacy. Maximum impact. And I said to this pastor, if you can discipline yourself as a pastor, I use the word discipline, if you can discipline yourself to love the one, no matter how big the crowd gets, can you love the one? Jesus was suspicious of the crowd. He didn't disciple the 5,000. He worked with 12, and we're sitting here because of the 12. But Jesus didn't neglect the one. The whole Bible are stories about the one. And I said to him, if you can find a way, and I said, if you, remember, I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. When, when did we give you a drink? When you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me. I said to him, if you can see Jesus inside of the person. If you can love Jesus inside of that person, I know they irritate you. I said, if you don't see Jesus inside of people, you will become irritated. You will become frustrated. You will see the crowd as the mob. You, you will always need more numbers to make yourself feel like you're doing something. But if you can give Jesus something to drink inside of that one person, if you can, the person that offends you the most, if you can peer inside with eyes of of wisdom and see the Lord Jesus then you can find and muster up love for that one person and if you can love that one person then heaven will back you up God does not care about human legacy he cares about leading many sons to glory many sons to glory he doesn't care about church membership he cares about sons daughters maturity growth quality decisions if you can look inside of that person who's so offensive, who smells on the outside, who attacked you last week, if you can find Jesus inside of them, if you can find Jesus inside of them, you can love Jesus inside of them, and you will be anointed by heaven to turn the person to right living. I'm convinced we've done church all wrong. Ah, That's too much. We still have lunch today. <laughs> we've done church all wrong. We told people, check your brain at the door and sit quietly and let the minister minister. I said this morning, God, we're already over time. Do I need to preach? I said, the story of Lloyd Minster won't be enough to satisfy our people. 
A testimony from Africa might not be enough to satisfy our people. I'll, I'll have to preach or they'll leave feeling like they didn't get church. And there's some truth to that. We come to hear the word of the Lord. But I want us to always remember the one person is a victory. 